From Community Public Radio, this is the CPR News. From New York, I'm Don DeBar. An interesting game being played on the world stage these past two days. It began with the expulsion of 35 Russian diplomats from the U.S. by Washington. Earlier today, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov proposed a reciprocal action with the proposed expulsion of American diplomats from Russia. Russia's foreign ministry and their colleagues from other agencies have proposed that President Vladimir Putin proclaim 31 employees of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and four diplomats from the U.S. consulate in St. Petersburg as persona non grata. However, less than an hour later, Russia's President Vladimir Putin said there would be no reciprocal actions taken and that a reset in relations will be sought with the incoming president, Donald Trump, next month. For more on all that, we spoke with Russian news agency Sputnik editor Dmitry Babich, who is also a frequent contributor to the CPR News. Dmitry, thank you for your time on such short notice. Uh, some amazing activity, the United States expelling 35 Russian diplomats uh, unprecedented even during the Cold War. They didn't do that during the Cuban Missile Crisis or Berlin. Um, and uh, then um, a proposal from Russia's foreign ministry to reciprocate and the president chiming in and saying, no, we don't have to do that. Well, yes, yeah, I, I think it's an amazing story. I think it's a Christmas ho- story for the whole mankind uh, because it, it looks like the uh, destruction of the innocence, the slaughter of the innocence that suddenly was not reciprocated. <laughs> because actually, if you look at the actions of the outgoing U.S. administration against the Russian diplomatic corps in um, in the United States, I mean, it was purely hostile, it was purely damaging, because uh, these two facilities that they, that the United States announced they would shut down in the states of New York and Maryland, mm. these are a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, health hazards, recreation facilities, uh, you know, in Russian we call it, uh, we call it houses of rest, you know, right. which means these are the places where actually the diplomats and their children could relax. Right. And uh, of course, shutting them down uh, did not improve uh, the American security in the least, but right. it, it sent a powerful message, something like, we don't like you, right. and we want you to be out of here, all 35 of you, in 72 hours. Which is even technically difficult because the new year... Exactly. I was going to say, this is the worst weekend possible. You have the end of the holiday season on this end at the airport and the beginning of the holiday season in Russia at the airport. So it's the worst travel day possible from the United States to Russia. And and the idea of Obama, I think, was to make it uh, very difficult precisely because uh, because of Russians' love for the United States, because right. there are hundreds of thousands of Russians living in the United States. And when they visit their relatives in Russia, they usually do it for the on the New Year. Yeah, right. Uh, because uh, it, it's, a, it's a general holiday in Russia, and it's the main holiday. Uh, even in the Soviet Union, it was the only non-political, non-ideological holiday. Right. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, the, the aim of the outgoing administration was quite clear. And and uh, there, were, there was a kind of a two-pronged Russian response. First, uh, the diplomats, because there are no tickets for the flights from Washington, D.C. to Moscow, right. and obviously it's very difficult to fly from New York, a special Russian government plane will go to the United States to pick up the, the, the expelled diplomats. Mm-mm. And what is even more uh, interesting, uh, President Putin suddenly uh, made a statement uh, that he regretted uh, the decision of Barack Obama and his administration to end their work on this kind of note. But he still congratulated, Putin congratulated Obama and his family with the coming new year. <laughs> uh, wishing them a happy new year. And Putin said, we would not expel a single U.S. diplomat. Right. We, we would not shut down any of the uh, American embassies' recreation facilities in Moscow. 
something that uh, the foreign minister Lavrov suggested we would do uh, in order to maintain reciprocity. Right. And I think it's uh, it's what the French call coup de grâce, you know, the, 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 I would say, you know, the, the strawberry on the top of the cake. Yep. Uh, Putin uh, invited the children of American diplomats working in Moscow right. for a New Year tree and Christmas celebration in the Kremlin. Right. <laughs> I know it, it's um, it, it's hard to uh, I, I'm just waiting to see how CNN and, and those uh, related outlets, whether the New York Times or MSNBC or Fox, how they portray uh, that move, where essentially rather than making a, a hell for the children, the diplomats and you know, the whole families are being expelled with them, of course, um, instead the American diplomats' kids being, and assuming their parents, being invited to the Kremlin to, you know, under the equivalent of the Rockefeller tree at the White House or something. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's a very good symbol. Uh, and it's the way uh, uh, the way wars are won in the 21st century. I think in the 21st century, uh, wars will not be won on the battleground and uh, to an even less extent, they will be worn in the newsrooms uh, of the newspapers, which no one any, any longer believes. Right. Wars will be won by generosity, by yeah. making and, uh, uh, you know, being the best newsmaker, making the most unexpected move, mm. but preferably, uh, preferably a kind move in response to some hostile action. Right. I mean, the idea is to win public opinion. That's that's the war that's being conducted. And you win public opinion by being generous instead of being stingy and, and petty. Absolutely. And uh, and it's interesting that uh, there was a PR war against Putin and Russia waged during the last few years. And uh, uh, in most of the cases, uh, the, the, the fighters in that war said things like, we put Putin in a situation where uh, uh, any move that he makes would be a losing one. For example, there was a so-called artist in Russia, uh, Pavlensky, who nailed his testicles to the Red Square, you know, to the pigs in the Red Square, saying that I put Putin in a situation without a way out because they either had to arrest me uh, and then they they lose because uh, it's uh, it's like uh, they're, they're cr uh, cracking down on free expression, or they would have to leave me on the square with my testicles still nailed to the ground, and that would make them look cruel. Uh, uh, well, I mean, Pussy Riot, I think, was the main, uh, was the same tactic, you know. Right. You either arrest us or uh, you uh, uh, let us do it again in the church so right. that the Christians would be, uh, would be insulted. So the best way to answer, uh, I absolutely agree, is, is uh, by doing something so generous that even the mainstream media would not be able uh, to, uh, you know, to ignore it. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, the, the Western media likes to ignore Putin's generous moves. Uh, they, they like to ignore, for example, his amnesty of uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky and other right. so-called activists uh, of the opposition, including, you know, the robber barons like Khodorkovsky, you know, the richest person in Russia of the 90s, right. which is like the richest person in Chicago of 1936. Right, that's right. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, it's it, it, they managed to ignore a lot of his uh, generous moves. But now, because of the hysteria that they themselves whipped up, uh, around uh, the, the expulsion of the Russian diplomats, they cannot ignore his response because they have been preparing, they have been bracing up for some kind of a wild, angry action from the side of the Russians, like expelling the whole embassy, you know, or 100 diplomats, or shutting down all communications with the, uh, with the uh, United States embassy, which looks like a citadel. Uh, right next to the Russian yeah, government right. building. Right. Uh, but uh, Putin's response was so uh, so unexpected that they simply will have to report it. Well, I, I got stuck back on the uh, idea of showing uh, generosity to the guy that and mercy to the guy that nailed his testicles to the uh, floor at uh, Red Square. I, I think it would start with severe pain medication. <laughs> I don't know what a maniac. I mean, Pavlensky, uh, uh, that was his style, his provocative style. Later, he tried to burn down a, a, 
a, a door, you know, which is uh, which was the entrance to the FSB building, and uh, that was the former KGB building. So when he in fact burnt it down, uh, uh, it, it was classified as a damage to historical monument because that's a very <laughs> important building built at the end of the 19th century. Uh -huh. So, so uh, there was a trial, uh, uh, and uh, somehow he's still not in jail. Uh, but I think uh, he sort of uh, he has overplayed his hand by, by destroying things, not his testicles, but a historical monument. He kind of went too far, uh, and he uh, sort of allowed himself to be uh, to be defeated in this PR struggle. So, in the, the real game going on here, um, that many are speculating about, is that what's happening in Washington is an attempt to constrain Trump from seeking better relations, from normalizing relations with Russia to the extent that that's possible after everything that's happened. And that uh, painting, on the one hand, um, Trump as a his election as a product of Russian espionage, hacking, whatever crazy images they want to invoke, uh, undermines his credibility and particularly with respect to Russia, where he might face the specter of not only impeachment, as you see leading Republicans call for tougher action against Russia, but even prosecution after impeachment for treason. Mm -hmm. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think the outgoing administration is doing everything to sabotage uh, a, a possible improvement of relations between Russia and the United States. And uh, it's very unfortunate because actually uh, Russia uh, is not being ideological in this struggle. Uh, I mean, uh, in the Soviet times, I'm sure a lot of the Soviet media would be uh, probably justly, you know, concerned about the amount of billionaires in in uh, in Donald Trump's future administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and the current Russian line is okay. I mean, we're not going to teach Americans how they should run their country. Right. If they elected a person who wants billionaires in his administration, that's their American affair. You know, what we want is just a normal relationship, something that would not put the whole world in danger, you know, right. and and uh, th this is a kind of a minimal requirement. You think? <laughs> and, well, I mean, uh, it's very difficult to, to fulfill, in fact, because of the prevailing ideology in Washington. And, and I think this is something that not all Russians understand. You know, I took part in several... Uh, television discussions, you know, like uh, the most prestigious Russian television talk shows on foreign policy, or on NTV channel, on the first channel. And, and the problem was that when I started talking about the ideology of neoliberals, and, and this being the real problem, not just a, a bad person in the State Department or even a bad person in the White House. No, a way of uh, thinking, a way of thinking. A lot of a lot of people were simply angry with me, or they they wanted to ignore me because um, it's it's so comforting to think that all the problems are just because we've got, we haven't got the right guy somewhere uh, in in uh, in the Pentagon or somewhere right. in the uh, State Department or somewhere in the White House. Right. It's not the absence of the right guy. The problem is the ideology. You have to right. fight the ideology, but. Fighting an ideology of regime change, actually regime change is just a tool of that ideology. It's, right. its ultimate aim is the construction of a, of a kind of a, a, a globalized, a neoliberal, uh, highly monopolistic uh, economic system that, right. that, that would call itself liberal, but which is in fact not liberal and not right. even market-based, because right. market economy is about many independent actors. It's not about big companies right. uh, with government help uh, controlling the, 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 uh, the supply and demand. So uh, they, they want this kind of economic system, and the regime change is a tool that they are using to, uh, to, to prop up this system as they are creating it. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, not all of the Russian elite realizes that this is something that they're going to face. Uh, the people, uh, which is probably natural before the new year, people hope for the better <laughs> in the coming year. Uh, and uh, it's very humane. It's in the human nature to tie your hopes to a single person. 
So a lot of persons in Russia, a lot of people in Russia, tie their hopes to Donald Trump in the same way as a lot of people in the United States, especially those supporting Obama and Hillary Clinton, uh, they tend to demonize Trump. I think the problem is not with Trump and uh, with uh, uh, with uh, characters, even such obnoxious characters as uh, as Victoria Nuland. The problem is with the ideology. And the sooner we realize it, both in the United States and in Russia, the better for all of us. Yeah, and this is something we discussed last time we spoke. Um, one of the real problems is it's so entrenched because the ideology has become institutionalized and it's the worldview, essentially, of the major institutions here. Absolutely. And, and the problem is that they actually don't care from where to operate it, this ideology. Uh, remember how Javier Solana, you know, the, the architect of the NATO's invasion of Yugoslavia, when he came to Moscow a few weeks ago, he said that he wouldn't like Donald Trump to run the Western world. He would like uh, Angela Merkel from Berlin to run the Western world. <laughs> and, and if you have this uh, vision of... Uh, 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 you know, uh, the Western world being dominated by the United States and having to having to uh, do everything for the interest of the United States, then your world vision would crumble. Because, in fact, uh, this ideology is not uh, nationalistic. It's uh, it uses nationalism. It uses, yes. for example, the Polish nationalism against Russia, the Ukrainian nationalism, the Latvian nationalism. But these people don't care from where they will run uh, the, the global system. Uh, they plan to run it from Washington with Hillary Clinton. Okay, she failed. She turned out to be an idiot. They immediately put all the blame on her personally. Let me remind you of the recent statement by Obama that if he had run That's right. against Donald Trump, he would have won. Yeah. So they, they suddenly, instead of finding her likable, as, uh, as uh, Paul Krugman said, they suddenly find her despicable, <laughs> and then they are ready to run the, the global system, not from uh, the Washington, not from Washington, D.C., but from Berlin. In fact, tomorrow they could run it from Warsaw or from Rome. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think Marx was wrong only in one of his statements. He said that a proletarian has no motherland. No, a proletarian has motherland. Capital has no motherland. Mm. It's absolutely all the same for the global capital, for the global monopolies, from where to extract profits. You know, if they can uh, have a plant with fewer taxes and more cheap labor in China, they will move it to China. Uh, if they can run the world from Washington, D.C., they will run it from Washington, D.C. But if Washington, D.C., for some reason, doesn't work, they can run it from Berlin or from London. So it, it's a system, it's an ideology, and it's a system that, that uh, can have multiple centers. So uh, uh, that makes it so dangerous. And, and uh, 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 until we define it, until we agree that the problem is not with a few uh, stupid people, the problem is with a, a, an anti-human ideology, we're going to always get disappointed, just like we got disappointed with Obama, and before him, we got disappointed with George Bush the Jr. And now we may get disappointed with Trump. The problem is not in personalities. The problem is in the ideology. And the, uh, the other uh, evil twin of uh, neoliberal ideology uh, is neoconservative foreign policy, um, which is, you know, part one. It's an appendage to it, really. It's the implementation of the ideology uh, at you know gunpoint essentially. And, well, uh, actually, yeah. it's interesting that these two uh, uh, these two so-called neoliberals and neoconservatives they love to criticize each other. You know, they love to put the blame on each other. But in fact, they're the same. Right. They are pursuing the same aims, uh, just uh, with different characters at the top. Uh, I mean, Obama made his electoral campaign criticizing George Bush, uh, the junior, as a neoconservative. But when he came to power as a neoliberal, he suddenly conducted the same policies with, with uh, sometimes even more cruelty. Right. I mean, George Bush, the junior, put people in secret prisons in 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 Poland or in uh, other places in the world, in Guantanamo, Obama just destroyed them from drones. So 
that's a nice uh, that's a nice transition from neoconservatism to neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you have different models. Neoconservative model was a conventional uh, invasion of Iraq. And the neoliberal model was the uh, Libya model, where they had let Al Qaeda overrun it and just bombed strategically to support them. But, you know, it's uh, it's basically the same military strategy. Uh, the whole difference is that uh, the neoliberals start an in, an internal insurgency, which they support by all means. Uh, and when the government in, in uh, the country, which is uh, an object of aggression, try to crack down on that insurgency, they say that these people breached the human rights, and now we have the mandate for a full-fledged invasion. So right. basically, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, it, it's a parody of real conservatism and li- real liberalism of the 19th century. A lot of people say that actually uh, conservatism and liberalism in the 19th century were not antagonistic. Uh, well, now the, the neoconservatism and neoliberalism are also not antagonistic. They're just terrible. Right. Both of them are terrible, pursuing the same aim. And sometimes, just like with the jihadists and the Muslims, you know, the, the, the first victims of jihadists are the, the traditional Muslims, in the same way, the first victims of the neoliberals are the traditional liberals. For example, to my mind, uh, President Putin here in Russia, uh, and that's an advantage of him and also a, a defect of him, let me be honest about it. Mm. He is a classical liberal. Mm. And look how he is hated by the neoliberals. Mm. This is the same, the, same, uh, uh, the same reason, the same impulse that makes the people from the so-called Islamic State slaughter Shia Muslim clerics clerics, and moderate Sunni Muslims simply because they don't toe their line of of jihadist Islam. And and that's the same drama that played out in the Democratic Party primary because Bernie Sanders is essentially a classic liberal and uh, Clinton a neoliberal and and looking just at the emails the way they held them in contempt it shows you exactly how neoliberalism views actual liberalism absolutely and uh, it's interesting that um, mm, with uh, Bernie Sanders unfortunately we had a situation when he gave up you know basically he uh, he behaved like those Muslims uh, in many places in the world. In Egypt, for example, when the jihadists come to power, they, they try to toe the line and to to be their graces. Uh, but with Russia, uh, I think it's the radicalism of uh, neoliberals uh, that, that, that put Putin in a situation when he simply had to resist because they were so aggressive uh, and they were, I'm sorry, so stupid. Uh, that they went against him head on, just like they went against uh, uh, the former Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych, who was corrupt, but who was not anti-Western, who was actually their man. Right. But they went against him and they, they went to great lengths. They were ready to see him dead with all of his family destroyed uh, by the Maidan so-called peaceful activists. So basically, Putin had no way out but to resist, you know. Uh, Bernie Sanders, unfortunately, unfortunately, I think he sort of uh, let himself be lured into their honey trap. Uh, he thinks that they are still liberals, even if they have uh, this, this prefix neo before their name. Bernie Sanders is wrong because the neo thing makes it completely different from classical liberalism. It's just like the, the simple uh, adjective jihadi before uh, the great word Islam makes it a completely different story. Yeah. Um, you know, going forward, uh, we are, we're entering a new year. And um, in Russia, uh, the New Year's weekend is the beginning of the holiday, and it closes with Christmas, which is the opposite of what happens here in the West. So you guys are just entering the holiday season. And Happy New Year, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you. And Merry Christmas to you next week. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. And uh, Merry Christmas to you, because actually it's the same Christmas. We're just using Different two calendars, yeah. Calendars. Julian calendar in, in Russia and... Uh, on the Mount Athos and uh, uh, the the conservative uh, Orthodox groups in Greece, also in Georgia, also in Ukraine. 
and the new Gregorian uh, calendar adopted by the Pope uh, and by uh, the majority of Western churches in the 16th century in the West. So going into the new year, um, there's going to be a new president, whatever he represents. During the campaign, he said he sought better relations with Russia. Despite all the pressure, perhaps in response to the pressure, to the contrary, he maintains that same position. Um, do you think there's some hope that things can get reset and maybe brought back to reality? Uh, well, uh, I want to hope because I am an optimist by nature, uh, but I think there will be a lot of provocations and still there is a very high chance that things may get even worse. Because uh, it's, it's not uh, a few bad persons who are the problem, it's the ideology. And, and uh, the other problem behind it is the unwillingness of the Russian elite, Chinese elite, uh, Turkish elite, even Syrian elite. The unw- unwillingness of these elites to see it as, uh, as an ideology and not as some kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding. You know, what happened in Iraq in 2003 was not a misunderstanding. What happened in, in Libya in 2010, 2011 was not a misunderstanding. Right. What happened in Ukraine was not a misunderstanding. So it's a simple thought, but it is too terrifying for the elites in Russia, in China, in Turkey, in India, you know, in many countries. Uh, uh, they suddenly have to realize that they are in for a very long and and the tedious fight for survival if they want to survive, and, and this is something that they don't want to accept. Uh, just like uh, uh, you know, I recently interviewed, uh, had a talk with a great uh, uh, British historian, uh, uh, Jeff Roberts, who who made the research on uh, Stalin's preparation for the war with Germany in 1941. Mm-hmm. And it was astounding, you know, the, uh, the revelation that he made to me that basically Stalin was not prepared for the uh, aggression from Nazi Germany on the 22nd of June 1941. Why? Because he hoped that there would be a split in the German leadership. The idea to attack Russia uh, so deep in summer seemed just uh, absurd and ludicrous to him. Uh, it was not in, in Germany's nationalist, national interest to attack Russia. So Stalin just refused to believe it. And he made a mistake because uh, Hitler was more of an ideologue than uh, even a German nationalist pursuing German nationalist interest. So in the same way, uh, until Russia, China, India and other countries, until they tried to appeal uh, to, to, the, uh, to the egotistic interests, of, of the United States and the EU, they will they will continue. I mean, the, the Russian and the Chinese elites, they will continue to get disappointed because the EU and the United States right now are guided more by ideology than even by their own financial interests. That's something that was predicted a long time ago uh, by uh, Soviet uh, politicians. That well, even before by Lenin, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he called imperialism the highest state uh, stage of capitalism. Uh, uh, he he was basically right, uh, and uh, and uh, in general, if we look at Marxism uh, and if we look even at Leninism. Uh, um, they they were not perfect in in the solutions that they suggested, but in their criticism of the capitalist system, they were pretty smart, and their vision still uh, is still right, more than one hundred years after after they they, they uh, made their writings. Dmitry Babish, thank you very much again. Happy New Year to you and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you, and uh, all the best to the listeners. And 
that's all the news we have for you right now. For Community Public Radio, I'm Don DeBar in New York. Thanks for listening.